Alright, so I'm going to talk about the next two chapters, so 14 and 15, that concern genetics. Alright, so I have rearranged the material in my lecture a little bit differently from how your textbook uh, presents the material. I'm going to start with some basic fundamental concepts that you should already be familiar with from, from high school. And we're going to build on those concepts and start talking about some more complex um, genetics problems, more complex um, non-Mendelian genetics, and some applications of these approaches. All right, so first we're gonna talk about a little bit of history. All right, so here, one of the one of the ideas about how individuals inherited their <clears throat> their traits involved this this pangenesis complex concept where there was this idea that all the different cells of your body had particles and these particles were called pangenes and that all these particles traveled from all the different cells of your body accumulating all the different traits of an individual even traits that extend over that individual's lifetime. And these are transferred to your, your gametes, your sperm and egg. So we know this isn't true. All right, so your, your gametes are not composed of <laughs> these individual particles from your somatic cells in the sense that all the traits you accumulate as an individual over your lifetime, whether it be genetic or not, have a non-genetic component, isn't gonna be transferred to your sperm or eggs. All right, we know that now, yes, the complement of chromosomes, the full complement of chromosomes that your sperm and eggs get, get half of this genetic complement that you would find in your somatic cells. All right, but the traits of a different body don't all infuse into your, your, your gametes. All right, also, any changes in your somatic cells don't influence traits in your, your gametes. Just because you get skin cancer doesn't mean that you're transferring that disease or transferring that condition to your offspring. All right, you can only transfer genetic abnormalities that may give an individual a predisposition for developing certain types of conditions or diseases. There's another idea called the blending hypothesis. All right, so this particular hypothesis is one that uh, Gregory Mendel had to contend with. Alright, so in terms of your, your blending hypothesis, all right, here for example we have red flowers, we have light flowers, all right, pure red, pure white. Their offspring are all pink. All right, so the idea here is that the, the offspring are basically a hybrid of the, of the parents. Now, this is, is right, but it's wrong, all right? Um, this particular situation is kind of a, um, it's very unique, all right? We'll talk about this particular situation of white and red flowers producing pink flowers a little bit later on. Um, you do see that yes, your, your, your offspring, your children do have various combination of alleles from parent A and parent B and that they could be completely different in traits or similar in traits to either parent. All right, but they're not a complete full hybrid all right in other words 
if you would expect to see this blending hypothesis, then you would never see in future offspring the reappearance of, in this case, red or white flowers. You can keep seeing this, this dilution effect. It's like mixing red and white paint. All right, you can continually see all right, the pink flowers become more and more and more pink or dilute over time, all right, which is what we don't see. Another idea was this, was this concept of inheritance of acquired characteristics. All right, so here you have a situation where, for example, you have giraffes, and giraffes over time, they had to extend and stretch their neck and their muscles became longer and thicker and their necks became longer and they had more vertebrae put in place as they stretched their necks and eventually their offspring, this particular trait was transferred to their offspring through the parental giraffes extending their necks. All right, again, you cannot pass traits to your offspring that are not heritable, that are not genetic. There has to be some kind of genetic component. All right, just because, you know, you're great at sports or another parent's great at um, being artsy and creative doesn't mean that your child is going to be great at sports or creative. <laughs> you know, traits that you accumulate yourself over time, they're not, don't have a genetic component at all, are, are not going to be passed on to your offspring. All right, so Gregory Mendel, he worked with pea plants. All right, so pea plants were a wonderful choice. Um, it's kind of one of these situations where he lucked out uh, when he worked with his, pea, with his pea plants because they're really easy to grow. He had all these different kinds of varieties, which you'll see in a little bit, and they're really easy to manipulate. All right, you can allow them to self-fertilize one another, or you can manipulate them so that you can control the crosses between plants. All right, so there are two key terms that you need to be familiar with, character and trait. They're not synonymous terms. Character is kind of a broad, all-encompassing term. Trait is very specific. All right, so here, a character would be something like eye color, all right? A trait would be something like blue eyes or brown eyes, or hazel eyes. And each of these traits are going to be encoded for by what we now refer to as, as genes. All right, so Gregory Mendel described these components as heritable factors. All right. So these these particular genes, all right, keep in mind that we are diploid organisms. All right, so let's say that, for example, brown eyes is a dominant trait. Well, keep in mind you have two chromosomes. Let's say that the chromosomes for eye color, let's say you have an imaginary uh, chromosome, let's say for all intents and purposes, let's say this is like chromosome two. All right, well keep in mind you have two copies of chromosome two. All right, so 
here you can have a an allele right for brown eyes here on one chromosome and you can have another allele for brown eyes on the other chromosome all right so you'll have brown eyes all right so here looking at Mendel's pea plants all right so here you can see how easy it is to manipulate the pea plants you can allow them to self-fertilize all right so this the sperm all right that's going to be released by the anthers of the the flowering plant will attach to the female organ of the plant stigma and that flowering plant will then be fertilized by the sperm All right, now you can also control, you can control and manipulate these crosses. You can remove the, the anthers, the male organs of one of your plants so they don't self-fertilize. And you can control the cross. All right, you can transfer pollen granules from one plant to the female organ of the other flower and control the cross. All right, now, here are a series of characters that Mendel looked at. He looked at flower color. All right, so the pea, pea plants come in two varieties in terms of flower color. They have purple, they have white. Flower position, you have axial and terminal. Seed color is yellow and green. Seed shape, round and wrinkle. Pod shape, inflated, constricted. Pod color, green and yellow. Stem length, tall, short. All right, so there are all these different varieties, but you also notice that you have one or another. All right, so you have two varieties for each character. All right, so you have two traits. So Mendel really lucked out, all right, because it was really easy to do, to analyze results from these crosses, because you're gonna get either one result or another. You're not going to get something in between. Now, granted, he didn't know this when he was conducting his studies, but we know it now. And it's something he concluded as well himself at the end of his studies. Alright, so looking at Gregory Mendel's research involving monohybricrosses versus the blending hypothesis. Alright, so let's look at what you would expect from the blending hypothesis all right so let's say that you have a pea plant and it has round seeds all right the male plant parent has and can produce only round seeds the female parent can only produce wrinkled seeds all right now you would expect as a result of this cross you'd end up with a, a blending of these traits a hybrid so you'd have offspring that would have a slightly wrinkled appearance and let's say that you cross two of these slightly wrinkled offspring you would end up with seeds that produce even more slightly wrinkled seeds all right now we know this isn't true all right because here Gregory Mendel when he crossed round seeds and wrinkled seeds, he got all round seeds in this first generation. All right, which is not what you would expect to see through the blending hypothesis. All right, but then when he allowed these all round seeds, allowed two of these plants to self-fertilize. The offspring that resulted were round and wrinkled. All right, so you would have the reappearance of parental phenotypes, which is something you would not expect to see if the blending hypothesis held true. All 
All right, so for each particular trait, all right, these traits are going to be encoded for by genes, and each gene can have a variety of, of variants. You can have a variety of different types of or versions of a gene. All right, so for a gene for eye color, or a gene for, for hair color, or a gene for, um, say, fur coat. All right, you can have, for example, let's say, you've got little guinea pigs. All right, you can have, let's say, black fur. Now let's say you can have, let's say, white fur. All right, let's say the black fur is dominant. Now let's say the white fur is recessive in terms of the alleles. Now, an individual that has black fur can have two copies of a dominant allele, or they can have a copy of a dominant and a recessive allele. An individual with, with white fur is going to have two copies of the recessive allele. Now, keep in mind that you have for a given given gene, right? You have fur color. Gene for fur color, you have black fur allele, white fur allele. Now, we always represent the alleles as individual letters. Alright? A dominant letter or capital letter being a dominant allele, the lowercase letter being your your recessive allele. Now these alleles since we're diploid. That means we have two copies of an allele of alleles for a given gene for a particular trait. All right, so going back to our little situation here, if you have two copies of your dominant allele, all right, then your homozygous dominant. In this case, you have black fur. If you have two copies of the recessive allele, all right, your homozygous recessive. In this case, for our little situation, you have right white fur. And then, if you have two, you have a copy of each. Your heterozygous. We have two different alleles. All right, in this case, you would have black fur. All right, because. That particular allele is dominant over the recessive allele. All right, so for each of these given genotypes, indicate whether or not it's homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive. Well, this first one, you have two copies of the recessive allele, so you're homozygous recessive. A copy of both alleles dominant and recessive, your heterozygous. Copy of both dominant alleles, your homozygous dominant. Alright, so for each of these genotypes below determine the phenotype. Alright, so we have purple flowers and we have white flowers. Alright, so two copies of the dominant allele, purple flowers. Copy of each, purple being dominant over white, purple flowers. Two copies of the recessive allele, white flowers. Alright, so looking at brown eyes versus blue eyes, brown eyes being dominant to blue, two copies of a dominant brown eyes, copy of each brown being dominant to blue brown eyes, and two copies of the recessive allele blue eyes. Alright, so for each of these phenotypes, give me the respective genotypes. Alright, so 
Straight hair is dominant to curly hair. All right, so straight hair could be two copies of dominant allele. You could be heterozygous. And if you're curly, you're homozygous recessive. Now, let's say pointed heads are dominant to round heads. Well, pointed heads, homozygous dominant, heterozygous. Or if you have a round head, this is a recessive condition. Homozygous recessive. All right, so here we're looking at, for an individual that is diploid, we're looking at two copies of a chromosome. All right, so one chromosome is paternal, the other chromosome is maternal. All right, so you have two copies of a chromosome, you're diploid. So on each chromosome, you have respective genes. They're homologous to genes on the other paired chromosome. All right, so for instance, looking at two given genes, or a single gene, with two different alleles. All right, so we have an allele for purple flowers and an allele for white flowers. All right, so for, the, for this case, we're looking at an individual that is heterozygous, all right, because you carry one copy of the dominant allele, all right, and you carry one copy of the recessive allele. Alright, so one allele for purple flowers, one allele for white flowers. Alright, so let's let's look at the the genetics behind this. What does this actually mean? That means for this particular gene, the gene for purple flowers, when it is going to be transcribed and then translated into a protein, an enzyme. This enzyme is involved in synthesizing the purple pigment that you see in the flower petals. Now, the white flower gene, the gene does not encode for a, an enzyme. It's not produced. All right, so this is why you see no pigmentation. All right, in your in your homozygous in your homozygous recessive flowers is because they carry two copies of the recessive allele, so they express the recessive phenotype, which is for white flowers, and they lack the enzyme needed to synthesize any pigments. So that's why I have white flower petals. All right, so one of the questions that Mendel addressed was, is the inheritance of seed shape in peas affected by whether the genetic determinant is a male or female? All right, so in other words, are we dealing with the trait being passed on from the mom to the offspring or from the dad to the offspring in terms of a dominant or recessive allele? All right, so for one cross, all right, your male has round seeds and your female has wrinkled seeds. All right, well, all the offspring in this case have round seeds. Okay, well, what if you do a reciprocal cross? What if you have it so that the female has the round seeds and the male has the wrinkled seeds? Well, in this case, all the offspring also have round seeds. All right, so this particular trait is not dependent upon the sex or gender of the individuals. All right, so for this case, it is an autosomal trait. All right, in other words, this particular trait is found on a autosomal chromosome, not on a sex chromosome. Now, when you're looking at a monohybrid cross, you're looking at the possible outcome of crossing two individuals involving a single characteristic. All right, so here, 
we're looking at two individual flowers that differ in a single characteristic, flower color. All right, so purple flowers and white flowers. All right, so we have true breeding parents. All right, now what I imply by true breeding is that the parents are homozygous. All right, so the purple flower producing plant is homozygous dominant for purple flowers, and the white flower producing plant is homozygous recessive for white flowers in terms of their genotype. Now when you cross these two individuals, all right, so we have our two possible gametes. Well, a purple flower with homozygous dominant can only contribute a copy of the dominant allele. All right. A, wh a white flower that's homozygous recessive can only contribute the recessive allele to its gametes. All right, so when you do your cross, the potential outcome is that 100% of your offspring are going to have purple flowers, all right? And they're all going to be heterozygous. All right, so this was our parental generation. This is our F1 generation. All right, now we're gonna look at what happens when you cross two of these heterozygous plants. All right, well, if you're a heterozygous individual, all right, that means that you can contribute a copy of the dominant allele and a recessive allele to your, your offspring. All right, so since we're crossing two heterozygous individuals, all right, the other individual can contribute a dominant and a recessive allele. All right, so the potential offspring, all right, looking at purple versus white. Well, two copies of a dominant allele, well, that's a purple flower. A copy of a dominant and recessive, that's a purple flower, purple flower. All right, so three out of the four boxes are going to give you purple flowers. All right, so that tells you that there is a 75% chance that your offspring are gonna have purple flowers, or you would expect that 75% or three-fourths of the offspring produced have purple flowers. All right, this is the expected outcome of this cross. All right, you would expect that from this cross that one out of the four individuals or a quarter of your offspring would have white flowers. So they're homozygous recessive. So here you see the disappearance of the recessive phenotype and then you see it reappear. All right, so this is why the blending hypothesis does not hold true. All right, so here you're looking at the distribution of phenotypes and genotypes from that cross. All right, so three quarters of the plants are gonna have purple flowers. One quarter are gonna have white. So three to one is your phenotypic ratio. For your genotypic ratio, one out of the four was homozygous dominant. Two out of the four was heterozygous. One out of the four was homozygous recessive. All right, so your genotypic ratio is one, two, to one. All right, so what happens when you're crossing two homozygous individuals? All right, so this is very similar to the example before, but we're looking at seed shape. So smooth, round, all right, so round and wrinkled, or smooth and wrinkled, all right. So dominant shape, seed shape is round. The recessive seed shape is wrinkled. All right, so here looking at the gametes that are produced. All right, so an individual that's homozygous for seed shape can only contribute the homozygous dominant allele in this case. An individual that's homozygous for, <clears throat> homozygous recessive for seed shape can only contribute the recessive allele in their gametes. 
All right, so you always go from assigning alleles to assigning genotypes to assigning what types of gametes each parent can give to their offspring. And then you make up the Punnett square. All right, so there's a step-by-step -step process for putting or setting up genetic crosses. All right, because everything up to this point is the hard stuff. Doing the Punnett square is easy. Okay, it's getting all the appropriate gametes that you're going to be using your Punnett square assigned. All right, so the result of this cross is that 100% of the individuals are going to be heterozygous and express the dominant phenotype. All right, so round or smooth seeds. All right, so what happens if we cross two heterozygous individuals? All right, so it's similar to the one we looked at before, but involving seeds. All right, well, again, heterozygous individuals, half of their alleles will end up in one gamete, half the alleles will end up in the other. All right, so that means that half the alleles and the gametes are going to be for the dominant allele, half are going to be for the recessive allele. All right, so. That means here there's a quarter percent chance for each possible outcome. All right, so here for individuals that are gonna have the round phenotype, all right, three out of the four boxes are for round, all right, one out of the four is for wrinkled. All right, so you'd expect that three-fourths of your offspring to have round seeds, one-fourth to have wrinkled. Again, your genotypic frequency is one to two to one. All right, because you have homozygous dominant, heterozygous two, homozygous recessive one. So one to two to one. All right, so let's look at a monohybrid cross involving mice. All right, so let's say we have mice with black fur and that the black fur allele is dominant and the white fur allele is recessive. Let's say you cross a heterozygous black mouse with a homozygous recessive white mouse. All right, so the genotype for this individual, if it's heterozygous black, so big B little b, and then a homozygous recessive white mouse, or a white mouse, all right, because a white mouse can only be homozygous recessive, because you have to have two copies of a recessive allele to have white fur, okay? So we have our genotypes, all right? So now we gotta figure out what gametes each parent can produce. All right, so our gametes will be from our white mouse. Well, 100% of the gametes are gonna be for the recessive allele because the individual is homozygous recessive. An individual that's heterozygous can contribute either the dominant or the recessive allele. All right, so let's set up our Punnett square now that we have our gametes. All right, so we put our gametes on the outside. All right, so we have our sperm, we have our eggs, and inside the Punnett square, we have our psychot. Now, it's always convention to put your dominant allele ahead of, ahead of your, or before your recessive allele. In other words, you won't do this. That's confusing, all right? It's always dominant for recessive. All right, so what's the phenotypic ratio? Well, looking at black fur to white fur. Well, big B, little b, big B, little b. All right, so heterozygous individuals have black fur, little b, little b, little b, little b. Homozygous recessive have white fur, so 50-50, or two to two, or 
one to one. It's 50 50. Or, in this case, two out of the four boxes. 50%. What's the genotypic ratio? All right, well, here we're looking at heterozygous to homozygous recessive. Again, it's 50 50. Or 1 to 1. Or 2 to 2. Or 2 out of 4. Or 50%. Homozygous dom or 50% heterozygous, 50% homozygous recessive. Now, you can set up what's referred to as a test cross. When you do not know the genotype of one of the parents. All right, so to figure out the genotype of one of the parents, if it's unknown, you set up this test cross. All right, so this is gonna be involved taking your unknown individual, whether the individual is homozygous dominant or heterozygous, you don't know, and crossing it with an individual that is homozygous recessive. All right, because the individual is homozygous recessive, it's going to express the recessive phenotype. All right, so you set up two possible crosses. All right, so here you have your your sperm in this example, all right, that's expressing the homozygous recessive phenotype. So, white flowers, all right? And here we have purple. Here we have white, here we have purple. All right, the only difference is that this individual is homozygous dominant, and this individual here is heterozygous. All right, so if the purple flower is homozygous dominant, then 100% of the offspring will be purple. They'll have a purple phenotype, purple flower phenotype. If 50% of your offspring is has purple flowers and 50% has white flowers, then the genotype of the parent is heterozygous for purple flowers. All right, so based on this outcome, all right, you would take your observed and you would take your expected. So you would take what you would observe in nature, compare this to what your expected phenotypic ratios are, and figure out the genotype of the parent. All right, so diploid organisms have two sets of chromosomes, all right? So again, all right, so far we've, we've let it be kind of, well, simple, all right? We talked about chromosomes and only one, one particular gene, but the reality is that you have many genes on a single chromosome. All right, so these genes are on a chromosome. <clears throat> Since you have a pair of each gene, all right, you can have, for a particular gene, you can have one that's homozygous dominant for another gene. It could be homozygous recessive, and another gene can be heterozygous. Okay. They are three independent genes that can have three different combinations of alleles. All right, so you have an individual that is homozygous dominant here, individual that's homozygous recessive here, heterozygous here. This individual could be heterozygous. This individual could be homozygous recessive for this particular gene. This individual could be homozygous recessive for this gene, could be homozygous dominant, be heterozygous. This individual could be heterozygous for that gene, homozygous dominant, or homozygous recessive. 
the idea here is that you're looking at many genes being inherited and that they may not be all the same in a sense that they don't have all the same type of genotype. You're not necessarily dominant for all alleles or recessive for all alleles or heterozygous for all alleles. All right, you could have different combinations. All right, because they are different genes. So in a dihybrid cross, you're looking at the inheritance of not one, but two characteristics together. All right, so we're looking at two different genes that are being inherited. Not one, but now two. All right, so how do we go about setting up a dihybrid cross? All right, so let's carry on with our example with our little mice. All right, so again, we're looking at fur color. All right, so black fur is dominant to white fur. Our other trait we're gonna look at is the inheritance of short fur and long fur. All right, so short fur is dominant to, to long fur in this example. So we have a black mouse with short fur that's mated with a white mouse with long fur. All right, so we have the phenotypes of the mice. So now we have to assign genotypes. All right, so what are the possible genotypes for black mouse with short fur? All right, well, this individual could be homozygous dominant for both traits. It could be homozygous dominant for fur color and heterozygous for length. Heterozygous for length, homozygous dominant for, or heterozygous for color, homozygous dominant for length. Or he could be heterozygous for fur color and length. A mouse that has white fur that's long. All right, both of these are recessive phenotypes, so you have to be homozygous recessive for both. Now, for this example, I'm assigning and picking a particular genotype for just this example. All right, so here I'm choosing the black mouse with short fur with this particular genotype. All right, so what gametes can he produce? All right, well, here, you, have to, you can use a foiling method to figure out what gametes you can produce. All right, so big B, big X, all right, because you're not inheriting one allele, you're inheriting two combinations, one allele for fur color and one allele for fur length. All right, so these have to be inherited together. So big B, big X, big B, little X. Big B, big X, big B, little X. All right, so there are two possible outcomes. Big B, big X, big B, little X. Now, how can you double check that your answer is, is right? Well, here's how. Two to the N power, N equals the number of heterozygous genotypes. All right, so we have big B, big B, big X, little X. Well, this is heterozygous. All right, so out of this particular genotype of this individual, we have one heterozygous combination. All right, so two to the one power. Well, that's two. All right, so we can produce two total different gametes. Gametes with two possible outcomes. You can have big B, big X, or big B, little X. All right, so what about the, the female mouse? All right, so that's got white fur, but it's long. Well, again, you can use a foiling method. Little b, little x, little b, little x, little b, little x, little b, little x. All right, so here, there's only one possible outcome. Well, how can you double check that this is right? Again, two to the n power, and being the number of heterozygous genotypes. All right, well, both these, Genotypes for this individual are homozygous recessive, so n equals zero. Well, two to zero equals one. All right, so there's only one possible gamete 
type that can be produced. All right, little b, little x. All right, so now let's set up our little cross. All right, so again, your gametes that you produce go on the outside. Big B, big X, big B, big X, big B, little X, big B, little X. All right, so these are from our, our little male black mouse with short fur. Little B, little X, little B, little X, little B, little X, little B, little X. These are from our female white mice with long fur. All right, so now notice that these are your gametes, all right? Don't try to combine the genotypes or put the genotypes outside. You always put the gametes on the outside. All right, you don't put the genotype of the parents on the outside. That's wrong. The gamete combinations always go on the outside of your Punnett square. Now we produce our little, little baby mice. All right, so we combine our respective sperm and egg, produce our zygotes. Now, notice, it's convention to combine alleles of the same type together. All right, so alleles for fur color go together. Alleles for fur length go together. All right, you don't do something like, for instance, this. All right, this is wrong. All right. You always combine alleles of the same type, fur color, fur length together. Again, the dominant allele comes before your recessive allele. All right, that's just typical conventional nomenclature. All right, so what's the phenotypic ratio? All right, so here are the two possible phenotypes. Black fur that's short, black fur that's long. All right, so 50-50. Well, black fur that's short, black fur that's short, black fur that's short, black fur that's short. Black fur that's short, 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 short. All right, so eight out of the 16 boxes. And then black fur that's long. Black long, 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 black long. All right, so again, eight out of 16 boxes, or 50-50, or one, one to one. What's the genotypic ratio? All right, well, we have big B, little B, big X, little X. All right, so heterozygous for both. Big B, little B, little X, little X. All right, homozygous, or heterozygous for one, homozygous recessive for the other. All right, so again, 50-50. These are all the same, these are all the same. Eight out of 16, these are all the same, these are all the same. Eight out of 16, so again, 50-50, or one to one. All right, so for each of the following genotypes, give all the possible gametes, knowing the proportion of each gamete for, your, for the individual. All right, so for this guy, big T, little T, big G, big G. All right, how do we get this answer? All right, well, you foil, big T, big G, Big T, big G, little T, big G, little T, big G. All right, so again, big T, big G, little T, big G. All right, so this is 50, 50. Well, how can you double check this answer? Well, you have one heterozygous genotype. Two to the one equals two. Well, you could produce two possible types of gametes, big T, big G, 
little t, big G. So that's right. All right, what about big T, little t, big G, little g? Headers I for both traits. Again, here are the possible outcomes. How do we get there? Big T, big G, big T, little g, little t, big G, little t, little g. All right, so what's the proportion? Well, one quarter for each, 25%. Well, how can you double check this is right? Well, you have in this genotype two heterozygotes. All right, big T, little t, big G, little g. Two of the two equals four. All right, well, you have four possible outcomes. Well, that's right. What about an individual that's homozygous dominant for one trait and heterozygous for the other? Well, here are the possible outcomes. Big T, big G, big T, little g. Big T, big G, big T, little g. All right, proportion, again, 50-50. How can you double check? One heterozygous genotype. All right, so two to the one gives you two. All right, so there's two possible outcomes. You're right. All right, so we're looking at, in rabbits, fur color, and we're looking at eye color. All right, so gray is dominant to white, to white hair. Black eyes is dominant to red eyes. All right, so what are the genotypes for each of these, or what are the phenotypes for each of these genotypes? All right, so big G, little g, little b, little b. All right, so big G, little g gray hair. Little bee, little bee. Red eyes. Alright, so it's a rabbit that has gray hair, red eyes. Little g, little g, big B, big B. Little g, little g is for white hair. Big B, big B is for black eyes. Homozygous recessive for both. White hair, red eyes. Heterozygous for both gray hair, black eyes. All right, so we have a male rabbit with the following genotype. All right, it's got gray hair and red eyes. Then we have a female rabbit that's got white hair and black eyes. All right, so here we set up our little gametes on the outside. So big G, big B is the only gamete that could be produced by this individual. All right, again, there's no heterozygotes. All right, so two of zero gives you one. All right, so that's right. And then we have big G, or little g, little g, big B, little b. All right, so the only possible gametes produced, little g, big B, little g, little b. All right, the fact that you have one heterozygous individual, two to the one power gives you two. All right, and we have two possible outcomes. All right, so that's right. All right, so once you set up your, your Punnett square with your gametes, all right, you produce your little baby rabbits. All right, so how many out of the 16 are gonna have gray fur and black eyes? 50%. All right, so gray fur, Black eyes, gray fur, black eyes, gray fur, black eyes, gray fur, black eyes. Well, this is exactly the same. All right, so eight out of the 16 boxes are for gray fur and black eyes. What about gray fur and red eyes? 50%. Gray fur, red eyes, gray fur, red eyes, gray fur, red eyes, gray fur, red eyes. Same thing here, eight out of 16, 50%. 
What about white fur, black eyes? Zero. That's not a possible outcome of this cross. What about white fur and red eyes? Right, that's also 0%. That's not a possible outcome. Or at least not, I'm not going to say possible. All right, these two individuals are not expected outcomes. All right, that's a better way to phrase it. They're not expected outcomes. It doesn't mean it can't happen, it just means that they're not expected. Okay. 